Hi everyone, this is Play. I can't wait to share some information about Play with you. This is going to be our topic for the next couple of weeks, and I'm really excited. Okay, so the Grade 10 Family Studies outcomes include how to play, how play enhances infant and toddler development. So we're going to talk about the infants and toddlers, how they develop through play, how the role of adults are a part of the play process and what's your role through play. The types of play, we're gonna talk about solid, solitary, parallel, cooperative, associative, and competitive play. We're gonna compare personal childhood play experiences with children today. So we're gonna talk about your play experiences as well as what children are doing today, especially during this time. What does play look like when you're at home all the time? We're also going to look at the Article 31 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the role of play in language development, verbal and nonverbal. So how did you play as a child? I want you to think about that. What would you do when you were five years old or seven years old or even nine years old? What, is, what did play look like for you? For myself, I had an older brother who's four years older than me, and I spent a lot of time on my own, a lot of solitary, which is just playing by yourself. And, and I found that playing with dolls was something I just gravitated towards. So playing with Barbies, playing with dolls uh, was kind of my go-to for solitary play. My brother and I would play together sometimes, but there was a lot of fighting between my brother and I, so um, we generally just did our own kinds of play. So I want you to think about that, what you did as a child. And now I want you to think about what children do today. So specifically being at home, not going to school right now, what does play look like? If you have parents that are at home, and they are working full time, you're probably not going to get the same play experience as if your parents weren't working. If you are maybe going to daycare during this time, what does that look like? So your play for children today probably looks a lot different than it would have two months ago or something. We also wanna think about how that affects children's development and like really long-term effects of not being able to play with others, not having recess with other friends. That's a big change that's going on right now. So play, some definitions. It is a range of voluntary, intrinsically motivated activities done for recreational pleasure and enjoyment. So a range of voluntary. So it's it's by choice. It's not someone forcing you to do this. It's by choice. Uh, it is intrinsically motivated. So it's coming from within. Again, no one's telling you to do it. It's coming from within. You have a desire to do this. And it's for recreational pleasure. So it's for enjoyment. It's for, it's for fun, basically. The National Playing Fields Association, NPFA, states that play is freely chosen, personally directed, intrinsically motivated behavior that actively engages the child. So as I'm saying this, like how many people have options for play, free play right now? I don't, like playgrounds have been closed. Uh, what are some free play things that that are, that are open for children right now. So that's something else to think about. And Lev Vygotsky is so a theorist. I'm, I'm, I think we talked about theorists before we talked about Vygotsky, um, but he talked about child development and identifying play as the leading source of physical, cognitive, linguistic, emotional, and social development. So he, he said that all of our development is learned through play. So all of our fine motor skills, all of our gross motor skills are grown and developed through play. And play occurs at every life stage. 
something to think about. You have play at different life stages in every life stage, but it's commonly associated with children. So I want you to think about what play looks like at your age and what play looks like at your parents' age and your grandparents' age. What does play look like for them? We're gonna start with infant play. The types of play that infants are involved in are of related a lot to their bodies and their caregivers. So the first one is actually called attunement play. So attunement, you're in tune, get it? You're in tune with another person. It's, a st it's basically an establishing a connection with someone else. And most often it is the newborn with the mother. So there, there's a relationship happening between the mother and the newborn during this newborn phase. And they are playing with each other in a way that is conducive to both of them. So diaper changes and feeding time and playing time. It's oftentimes it's, it's just this relationship that's building. The next one is called body play. So this is where an infant explores the way in which his or her body works and interacts with the world. So they're making, an example is they're making funny sounds with their body. So they're, they're using their hands to make a sound. They're clapping for the first time. They're holding onto their feet. I just keep looking at this picture on the upper right hand side here of this baby grabbing onto their feet. That is playing with their body. They're trying to figure out how their feet move. They're trying to put their feet into their mouths. They're trying to just interact with how their body works. And it's a very fascinating time for them. So it's a uh, body play during infancy. So babies spend much of their time in solitary play. So as I mentioned, we'll talk about that later, where they're manipulating objects. So babies are given a rattle, um, a teething toy, something like that to look at, to touch, to feel with their mouth, and they're manipulating it. That's how they're playing during infancy. The other type of play that we talk a lot about uh, in preschool time, uh, preschoolers, is symbolic play, where they're they're taking an object and they're pretending it's something else. So this is the beginning of it, and this happens during infancy. So they're becoming familiar with objects and what they do and what they represent. So they're taking a little toy car that maybe has um, a little like bell in it or something, and they're rolling it around on the floor, and people are teaching them that cars make a sound, like vroom vroom, or they're taking a cow and they're pretending that they're moving the cow around. And I'm doing it with my hand, but you can't see it obviously. Um, but they're representing another object with a toy. So they're telling them, you know, a cow makes the moo sound. And this is how babies are learning about each of these objects. And this is how they learn, which is pretty cool. So that's infant play. Toddler play. This is a really, really important time for toddlers. So play is their work. It's like going to their job. So they wake up, they got to go to work. So they get their clothes on, they brush their teeth, and now it's time to work. So they got stuff to do. They are, and they take it very seriously as well. So you can take, see this picture of these three little preschoolers just so focused on their activities, so focused on their building. And they're also learning new skills during this time. So for example, learning to... Another thing toddlers are learning about is their relationship with others. So they're using time during the play world to learn about their relationships with their caregivers. So it's a give and take kind of communication that they're doing and they're learning about their their role as a playmate. So they do this with adults, they do this with other children. So they they learn a lot about social emotional relationships through play. One of the types of play we're going to talk about now is called object play. 
So they're, this is probably the most popular type of play during toddlerhood. It's things that are around the house. <laughs> I find that toddlers don't really want to play with the toys you give them. They want to play with things that are around the house. So an example here is banging pots and pans. Um, they're handling physical things in ways that use curiosity. So they're using anything they can get their hands on, whether it's a box or maybe a toy, and they're using their, their fine motor skills and their gross motor skills to handle it and manipulate it and see what it can do. So if, for example, they take a pot and another pot, which sounds like a terrible idea, sounds really, really loud in my opinion, but anyways, taking two objects that don't normally have a play value and putting them together. So putting one inside the other or putting them together, clapping them together. Um, my daughter loves to play with pom-poms and we put pom-poms in a variety of different containers. So we have little Tupperware containers with lids and she can spend 20 minutes sorting the pom-poms, putting them in different containers. And this is all about the object. It's playing with the object. It doesn't have a new role to play in their lives. It's it's just the object and they're trying to figure it out and try new ways of, of working with it, which is a lot of fun. And again, very simple play. It's just a lot of fun to watch toddlers do this kind of play. So now we're gonna look at the adult's role in play. So your job as a playmate is number one, to follow the child's lead. This is how the child is going to develop a relationship with you and trust you when you, you kind of go along with what they want to do. Um, one of the things that we try to do a lot in nursery school is um, letting the child do the acti activity on their own and then we can help them in certain ways, but um, another, so in one of the other points here, so show the child how to use a toy, but hold off on doing it for them. So this is a great way to introduce a new toy or to introduce a new activity, is to show them the basic function of the toy, but then let them figure it out, let them do it. So an example is stacking one block on top of another for them and then get them to try. So giving them the block and then they can stack it on top of the other one. Turn taking. This is something that children are going to have a challenging time with and you as the caregiver in play you can show them how to take turns. So this is um, this is new a new concept for them where you take a turn and then they take a turn. So you actually have to, maybe once you set up an activity, you pause, like you just wait for them. You don't, you don't need to give verbal cues. You don't need to give more instruction. You just wait. You, you can use facial expressions, um, but this is the time just to wait and see how they interact with the objects that are there. So they, then they recognize that after they do something, then it's going to be your turn. So it's this back and forth that they are learning. And that's one of your jobs as a, as an, a role model in play and read the child's signals. This is so important. Observe the sounds that they're making and the facial expressions they're making. Are they frustrated? Have they had enough or are they ready for more challenging things? Are they bored with it? This is a great example of how observation is used in childcare. And especially I find with toddlers, they get frustrated very easily and they don't know how to bring themselves back down to um, a stable point, basically. So, you know, observing them and just saying, okay, now it's time we're going to put this away. Let's move on to something else. So it's something really to think about. Okay, so we're going to talk about the types of play. So there's solitary, parallel, 
cooperative, associative, and competitive. So Mildred Parton, 1902 to 1970, she developed these types of play. She did lots of research into, she watched a lot of children and how they played, and she did lots of this research, and she came up with these different types of play, and we'll see how important they are in, um, in children's development. So the first type of play is called solitary play. So this is when uh, a child plays alone because A, they have not developed socially or they have chosen that, chosen that alone time. So again, this happens not only in infancy, but all the way through our lives. We choose, sometimes we choose solitary play as we get older, just depending on the activity we're doing. Uh, it gives the child, there's lots, sorry, there's lots of benefits to solitary play. The first one is that it gives a chance for the child to think. Really gives them a chance to think on their own and decide what they want to do. It gives them a chance to explore their world, use their imagination, because they're not going to use their imagination very much if, if there's a group of people around or if there's an adult right there with them. They're not going to exercise that part of their brain. They can also make up their own rules, which is the best part. I love solitary play. That's what I spent most of my time uh, doing when I was younger. And I could make up my own stories. And I loved the stories they had created because they were mine. Um, so it was actually harder for me to play with others because I was so focused on my stories and my storylines that I didn't want to play with other people. But it takes some time, right? Some, I guess I wasn't developed enough socially to play with others nicely, but anyways. So it helps develop a lot of things. It helps develop creativity, helps develop concentration with, a, like, with, um, with an activity. If you're really focused on something, it gets your, your brain working in a certain way. It helps develop persistence. So if you are playing alone, there's no one else there to help you in a in a good way though right you don't want to have a child playing on their own and get frustrated that's not very fun play um, but it helps them overcome things if they're playing on their own it also helps develop completion so they can go from a task from beginning to end and they can learn how to complete things on their own and as I mentioned it does continue as children get older Okay, so parallel play. Before we start, I want you to think about parallel lines. Parallel lines, they are beside each other, but they never ever touch, right? So they run along each other, but they never touch. So this is an example of children, how they play together, but not with each other. So they're side by side, but they're never interacting with one another. So they occupy the space. Um, they're involved in their own place. So as you see in this picture in the upper right-hand corner, you see someone making a sandcastle and the other little girl playing with the water. So they're doing separate types of play, but they're near each other. Oftentimes in parallel play, you'll hear uh, conversations happening, but most often they're conversations of their own which is an interesting observation in itself. So uh, again, parallel is beside each other, but not interacting with each other. It's the first form of social interaction between 12 months and three years. So even though they're not playing with each other, they're still maybe watching the other child. So they may be observing them. Um, they may be able to see, oh, okay, so that person's doing that with that thing. So maybe I can do that with my toy that I'm doing, or that I'm making. So they're learning, but not by them telling them. Does that make sense? <laughs> they're just by, they're learning through observation. Uh, and also parallel play is going to build some confidence. So if they can play alongside someone else, they really learn to enjoy what they're doing and be confident in what they're doing. Okay, the next one is called cooperative play. Cooperative thinking like you get along. 
That's what cooperative play is. So it focuses on children working together to achieve a common goal. And it begins around the age of four or five because they're able to use their social skills. Before this age, they are not able to cooperate regularly. So cooperative play doesn't really happen until the age of four. So they're playing in a group that's organized for making uh, material products. So maybe they're working together to make a bird feeder. They are striving to attain a competitive goal. Maybe they're on a sports team and they're working together to win the game. Dramatizing situations of adult life. This happens a lot in dramatic play. So they're working together to, you know, maybe they're working together in the kitchen. One's making, you know, working at the stove. The other one's setting the table or something like that. So they're, they're using adult life as the the inspiration and then they're acting it out with other children it's also very fascinating to watch the children as they as they create these adult environments and see what they come up with also for playing formal games like monopoly or uh, scrabble or something like that you have to follow the rules and take turns so again four or five is again pretty young age, but this is when they start to understand what cooperative play looks like. Cooperati cooperation is a learned behavior, so they don't understand what it means or what it looks like, so you have to teach it. It's about asking permission and respecting others while you're playing. So can I do this? Or um, And also respecting other people's space. So I'm thinking like a soccer game, right? You're not going to crash into your peer or your playmate, right? You're going to be respecting your others that are around you. You have to be able to self-regulate, meaning that you need to regulate your emotions and regulate the things that you say. So you're not going to be saying rude things to your peers. You're not going to be having a tantrum on the floor. These are ways of self-regulating. So that's what cooperation is part of as well. You're able to collaborate, so taking ideas from others and working together to create a new um, activity or a new uh, type of play. Uh, you have to be able to play as a team member. So if you're not able to play as a team member, maybe you're able to uh, you're not able to listen to others, then it's going to be really hard to be on a team. Cooperative play helps children with effective communication, so it teaches them how to communicate their feelings and their um, thoughts with others. It's also really important for accepting differences in others. So maybe getting a group of children together, they're not usually playmates, but once you get in a cooperative setting, then they're more likely to become friends or just being accepting of others. It also lets you trust others, which is also an interesting point. Okay, associative play. This is the first type of social play by preschoolers. It's not working toward a common goal. So we'll see some examples here of the difference between associative and cooperative. So it's playing separately, but it's involved with what the others are doing, which is different from parallel. Again, parallel, you're playing near one another, but you're never playing with the other person. So this is different. Um, but there's no division of labor or organization. So this is different than cooperative in that you don't have a common goal and there's no one like in charge. You're just kind of working together. Each child has its own interest and does not conform to what others are doing. So for example, this little picture here of a couple, a couple of children playing in the sandbox, they can still play together, but they're not upset if one other person wants to build something else like they can do whatever they want and they're working together for maybe making a sandcastle but there's no one kind of regulating that no one has to tell them oh you have to make a sandcastle they've just decided that on their own some attempts to control others and learns dynamics of social place so this is a really important lesson for some children i can just think of one child in nursery school uh, olivia she 
always love to direct other children and tell them what to do during play. And because she has younger siblings, so she's been able to direct the play of other children and they've been happy with it. But when she gets into a group of children her own age, some of them don't want to do that. Some of them don't want to take on a role that someone else has told them. So they're going to say, no, thanks. I don't want to do that. So they learn to change how they interact with children. They become more interested in other children than their toys. So this is the type of play, like dramatic play, as I mentioned, uh, is a really good example of associative play where children are more focused on the roles they're playing rather than the physical objects that are in their hands. So that's like, again, very different than infant play, which was a major focus with the toys. But now as they get older, they're more, fo more focused on the other children. Associative play helps children develop skills in socialization, problem solving, sharing, cooperation, and language. So we're going to talk about language and how it helps in, in play in a second. But it helps a, a lot of parts to development in children through this associative type of play. Okay, competitive play. Competitive play is a type of play that often happens in, I just think of siblings. Siblings have a lot of competitive play. Rivalry for supremacy, that just think, speaks to um, siblings in my mind. But there's a prize, there's an honor or advantage of winning. Competition is about winning and losing, exactly. So there's someone who wins and someone who loses. There's a lot of value in this type of play, but we have to think about both sides to it because there are some disadvantages which I'll talk about in a second. Competition is a learned behavior. It's not you're not actually born with it, which is interesting. Children are shown how to be competitive. It's an interesting thing to think about. Children ha handle co competition based on their temperament, their culture, their talent and their age. So depending on their emotional regulation skills, their age, what their abilities are, that's how they're going to handle competition. It helps build confidence, self-esteem, and a healthy attitude about winning and losing. So those are some really great things about competition, but we also have to think about some disadvantages. So for example, if we're so focused on winning, whether it's a sport, or an activity that you're a part of, if you're so focused on winning, then the educational purpose is lost. You're not there to learn, you're there to win. And I think that type of language or that type of play really loses the effect of play because you're not playing, you're there to win. And moving on to the next point, some people think that winning at any cost is is acceptable and that's very stressful and some may feel humiliation or loss of self-worth through that so if you're focused on winning you know cheating bribery all these types of thing go into winning then the t that type of play is completely lost it's not that's not the the purpose of it and disadvantages you may avoid losing by cheating, lying, or changing the rules, which it's funny, my six-year-old tries to change the rules of Monopoly on me all the time, and I have to remind him that that's not how you play, and that's not how you're gonna win, so follow the rules. So anyway, so that's competitive play. Okay, so the UN, National United Nations, made um, a convention on the rights of the child, and this was a document for all children across the world. And so they came up with all these different articles about what children need and what they deserve to be, to grow into uh, healthy children. So this article 31 specifically talks about play and they recognize that the child needs to engage in play and recreational activity. So they're saying every child has the right to play. Every child has the right to play. Uh, it also respects and promotes the right of the child to participate fully in cultural and artistic life as well. So another type of play is 
playing with artistic tools. So drawing, painting, coloring, all these things are another type of play and every child has the right to that. Something to think about in different parts of the world where some children do not have access to this. Some children are not able to play. And this is so interesting with what's going on in the world right now is that children were not allowed to leave their homes. They were in lockdown. They were not allowed to leave their homes. And one of the first things when they were able to ease restrictions is that they allowed the children first. They didn't say the adults could come out yet. <laughs> they said the children could play first. So they gave the children some time, a designated amount of time between certain times of the day, probably with one caregiver, to come outside and play. And this is something you need to think about in these situations, right? You, ha you have to think about all the children and what they're doing and how that's affecting their worlds. All right, play in language development. Children develop their communication skills through play. A lot of what we learn how to talk, how to understand other people is through play. Infants begin communicating with eye gazes and facial expressions. This is probably the most amazing part of being a parent is the first time your child smiles at you for real, for really, really a smile. The first time my son smiled was probably in the hospital and it was not a real smile. It was like, I'm so full of milk. I'm so happy. I'm going to smile. It wasn't a real smile until he was probably three months old and he actually looked at me and he made a smile, like a real smile with eye contact. And then I knew that this was a real way of communicating with me. And that was probably the most amazing part of his development. I just love that part. So that's the first time they're, they're actually communicating with you. Caregivers imitate cooing and babbling, which encourages more sound. So when you're talking with a baby who doesn't actually have words, you can still talk to them by cooing and babbling and making the sounds that they're making in response. And they're going to think, oh, wow, cool. This caregiver is making the same sounds as me. So that probably means that that's a really good thing. So I'm going to keep doing those. And it encourages more sounds and more communication, which is it's like a snowball. It just keeps happening, which is awesome. Toddlers, they're during for language development, they imitate a lot of the language and behavior of others all of the time, but they do this a lot in make-believe play. So when they're pretending, when they have a little farm and they have some animals and they are pretending that the animals are making their animal sounds like mooing and baa-baaing and neighing, that's a good neigh, I think, um, they are learning what others have taught them. So they're imitating what the caregiver has shown them. One of the things my daughter does, and she's two and a half right now, is at bedtime we do story time. So we read some stories. And if I give her a story, she's in her bed and I give her a story and I'm like, okay, I'll be right back. I just have to go brush my teeth or something. I'll come back and she's pretending to read the story. She has the book open with her and she's looking at the picture. So she'll look at a picture of, we have this um, book about a mouse. And so this mouse wakes up and it, it uh, has some, it has some breakfast, has some pancakes in the morning, and then it gets dressed and it does some stretches. So she doesn't know the exact words from the story because she cannot read. However, she says a lot of the words that are from the picture, which is basically like reading the story. She's two and a half and it looks like she's reading. And then I come in the room and I see her and she's smiling at me and she's like, I'm reading. I'm like, yes, you are. Like, it's so cool to see them imitate because I've read the story a thousand times. But anyway, so she does a lot of imitating right now. A simple game. Here's an example. A simple game of rolling a ball back and forth develops the idea of turn taking, which is important for conversational and interactive play skills. Just the idea of rolling a ball back and forth. This is turn taking and it's important for conversations. How do you converse with somebody? How do you talk to someone? You take turns, right? 
you have the ball and you pass it to someone else and they pass it back to you. That's how conversations work. It's this back and forth. And that's a perfect example of how language begins and continues. Okay, so for our assessment, we're gonna look at our own personal childhood play experiences. You're gonna write about your childhood, what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it smelled like, what it tasted like. Think about all of your senses and what memories do you have of, a, of you being a child. Write me a page of what that looks like. What, was, what kinds of games did you play? Who were your friends when you were playing with as a child? So under the age of 10 is what I want to hear about. So under the age of 10, what was your childhood play experiences like? So that's a page. Then one other page, so another full page is what I want you to write for what children are doing today for play. So this is such a very different time for children and I want you to think about what it's like for children in lockdown or recently allowed to leave their homes. What is play like for those children? Then the second part is I'm gonna get you to create a video or a poster or some sort of creative way of telling you about one type of play. So solitary play, parallel play, cooperative play, associative play, and competitive play. I think I got all of them, yeah, five of them. You're gonna choose one of those types of play and you're gonna create a video for me. So whether it's a video of someone in your home doing a type of play or you doing the type of play, you can get someone to video you. Whether it's, like it can be super simple, you can have a toy or a game that you're playing and just play it and that's solitary play. You can have parallel play where you and your brother or your mom are, you know, maybe doing your own type of game. Maybe you're all both playing on your iPads or something and you're both playing a game. So that's parallel play. Cooperative or associative or competitive, maybe there's a chance for you to get together with one other person and show this to me. Maybe you and your dad are doing a puzzle together. That would be associative, right? Or cooperative? We'll think about it. So those are the two types of assessment I'm gonna get you to do. We're not gonna worry about the last one because we're not in nursery school right now, but writing about your play experience and creating a video or a poster for me.